Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful morning it is. Um, I'm going to start. I'm going to start with just some prayer. Oh. Lord, thank you for today. God, thank you for the joy that is in this room. God, fill this place with your Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray that today you would humble my heart. That you would speak through me, Jesus. It would be only your words, God. I thank you for everything you do in our life. Amen. So this morning I have the privilege of um, not throwing my computer off. There we go. Uh, The privilege of finishing up our sermon series on Philippians. And so uh, we're just going to kind of dive right in. We're in Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 10 through the end. Um, So if you want to open up your Bibles with me, you're more than welcome to. Um, It starts with, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. This is Paul speaking to the Philippians. I rejoice greatly in in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the situation I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your uh, acquaintance with the gospel, When I set out to Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except for you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and I have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have uh, received Ah, Epaphroditus, there we are. The gifts you sent. Man, I practiced that so many times at home. Mm. They're a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, and pleasing for God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Jesus Christ. To our uh, God the Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Great Uh, Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. The part that uh, really stuck out to me when I was first reading this was, uh, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstance I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in, every, in, uh, in any and every situation. And I thought to myself, oof, i got to speak on contentment. <laughs> A hard thing that I feel all humans kind of struggle with. And especially in our culture, in our society today, where it is the complete opposite, right? Of wanting more, and needing more, and needing a bigger house, a better car, a newer iPhone, whatever it is. And so I was racking my brain and really trying to think about this, of like, all right, Paul said, uh, I have the secret to being content in any and every situation. And I thought to myself, am I content in every situation? Uh, And I try. I really want a jet ski, but I don't have one. Am I content with that? I am now. But am I content in every situation? And I was really struggling when thinking about this of like, man, I could go in so many different ways with this. And like, what is the secret to contentment? What is the secret to happiness? And what a heavy subject. And the more I was trying to think about being content, the less content I was being and the more stressed out I was getting. And I was just like, Lord, what is going on? I don't know what to do. And then Jesus said to me, keep reading. I was like, (laughs) okay, God. So I have the secret to being content in every and any situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Here it is. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. 
I can do all this through him who gives me strength. It's a simple concept. We take that verse a lot, right? A lot of people use that verse. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And sometimes we take that verse and we bend it a little of, I, I know I've been in a situation to where I'm not feeling content with something or I'm feeling stressed out about something or anxious. I try, to, I, I try to figure it out and I think about things and I think and I think and I lose sleep. And realistically, I'm taking this verse as I can do all things when I figure it out. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And the verse doesn't say, I can do all the things Andrew wants to do, who gives me strength. The verse doesn't say, I can do all things in my timing, who gives me strength. Doesn't say, I can eat 12 McDoubles in one sitting through him who gives me strength. I tried it. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And I don't know about for you guys, but for me, sometimes I have a hard time with like, like obviously we can hear that, and we've probably heard that so many times, but there's, we still struggle with being content in life. We still struggle with stress and with worry. We still struggle with like, God, where, where are you moving in this? Where are you moving in this situation? Or still wanting or being distracted by things on this earth. And for me, I feel like I kind of need like an A plus B equals C. I need a little bit more instruction of like, okay, you do this and you do this, and this is the outcome, right? Am I, am I, is anyone else with me? If I need a little bit more of like, okay, I just need some like, just do this and you're good. And so for me, with maybe some of these general sayings, it's hard, and I was reading through this and thinking that and reading through these verses, and one thing really popped out to me. So if you have your Bibles, maybe if you write in your Bible, uh, underline it or, or highlight it or cut it out and uh, put it back in, I don't, whatever you want to do, um, It says, I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. And the word being learned. We're not going to hear maybe this verse one time, and all of a sudden, boom. Oh, I get it. I can be God. I can do anything through him who gives me strength. We can consciously get that, but do we practice that? And one thing through this is is, is Paul learned to do this. When he had had a lot of money, when he was very rich, he learned to be content. Not saying it's a sin to have a lot. But when he didn't have a lot, he learned to be content. When he was working through the sins of his past, and I'm sure he did because he used to murder Christians, he learned that Jesus is his Savior. He's writing this from jail in a situation that probably doesn't seem great. He learned to be content in that. And so my first thoughts is, all right, what did did you learn? And so I went back um, into the verse a little bit, and and starting with verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. I love Francis Chan has an awesome... um, a message on joy, and he says, like, in this, in this message, he talks about uh, kind of joy being a, a, a commandment from God, and often we don't think about that as a commandment, right? Sometimes we think about, like, like, the things that we have to do and the things we really shouldn't do, but joy, kind of a nice one to try to practice, and Francis Chan points out that, that, that God says it's twice. It's so important. He doesn't say that about, like, murdering people. He says, don't kill anyone. Let me say it again. Don't kill anyone. He says, no, rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in, uh, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And so if we're supposed to find joy in every situation, if we're supposed to always be joyful in our troubles or in our trials in life, if we're supposed to find joy in knowing that God is going to help us learn something through everything, and if we're supposed to not be anxious about anything, which is a tough verse to read from a pretty anxious guy, do not be anxious about anything. How do we do that? By prayer and petition. We have these things we're supposed to do, The how, it's just through prayer and petition. Petition means you do it over and over and over again. These are simple concepts, but how often do we put it into practice? I talked to my students a couple weeks ago about, about, uh, as they're in sports, right? I get these these 
awesome three weeks. Uh, three weeks in the fall slash winter, and three weeks they just ended where there's no sports. It's awesome. I get everyone. Well, not everyone, but a lot of them. And uh, we talked about sports, and we talked about, like, all right, um, I have a, a leadership team where we were talking with a lot of our students, and they were like, man, I, I feel like my faith is just kind of dull right now because I'm may, maybe not spending a lot of time with God, or, or I, I, I uh, this saying, I want to go deeper. Oh, I just want to go deeper of, like, okay, wh- what does that mean? And I talked to them about, in your sport, let's go with soccer. If you're a soccer player in the beginning of the year, and you spend one, no, ten minutes a day practicing, right? They have two hours. Sports are out of control these days. They have like 16 hours a day of where they're practicing, right, for JV. And um, they're practicing all the time. But I said, all right, take that. And and if you only spend 10 hours of practicing a day, how good do you think you're going to be at at soccer as this example? They're like, well, well, it's terrible. You're not going to be in shape. You're not going to grow in your skills. I said, okay, so if the most important thing in your life is Christ... And what you truly want is to be a man or, or woman of, of God, then is 10 minutes a day enough? Are we constantly, if we're struggling with contentment, if we're struggling with being anxious and not finding joy, are we spending time with God in prayer? Are we putting in just a, a, an hour a day of prayer? Are we trying to fit our day around God instead of trying to fit God in our day somewhere? By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, presenting your requests to God. So the things we're supposed to do, how we do it, by just you immediately going to God, and here's the fruit. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ. Are we fixing our eyes on Jesus in every situation? When we feel comfortable, when we feel good, when we feel like we have plenty, when we feel like we're in a good, maybe financial state where we're, or our family is in a good spot, or you're in a good spot in your marriage, are you always going to God in prayer to continue that? Or when you feel really strapped for money, or when you feel like you want the next best thing, but you just can't afford it. Or, or when you feel like your family may be kind of falling apart a little. Or you're not, you don't love the decisions your kids are making. You don't love the spot you're in in your marriage. Or you don't love the spot you're in in life and your career. Are you content knowing that, that Jesus is doing amazing things? And realistically, some of those things just don't matter. Are we first coming to God. Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him endures the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Are we fixing our eyes on the pioneer and perfecter of faith? Is that our first decision when we want contentment in life? I think all of us do. If we want to be just content in whatever situation we're in, Are we fixing our eyes on Jesus? A simple thing, but do we do it? In the morning, do you wake up and immediately pray? Or is your first decision to check an app on your phone? When you're going into work, are we praying for our coworkers and for our day that God can maybe show up in a beautiful way? Are we praying for our marriages, for our friendships, for our relationships, for our, how we act in front of strangers so maybe people can see a little bit of Jesus through you? Are we praying for those every single day? And I was trying to think of what are the things that distract us from that? What are the things that distract us from contentment? And one thing I talked about was money. Our culture, this world is so obsessed with getting more and more money and more and more fame. Jim Carrey, uh, one of my favorite comedians, uh, he has an awesome quote, and the quote is, I wish everyone could get rich and famous and everyone, or, and everything they ever dreamed of so that they can see that's not the answer. The lottery, uh, the Powerball and the whatever else the other one's called, is up to like $1.5 billion right now. 
and I was doing research, and I, I don't know about you guys, but I've, I, I, once in a while, maybe daydreamed about, like, what would it look like if I won the lottery? What would I do? And obviously, to, like, not feel guilty about it, but like, oh, first pay the church's debt off, and then, like, after I say that in my head, I can continue on, I'm like, I'd buy this house, and I'd get a jet ski. Uh, <laughs> we've all been there, I hope. And uh, winning the lottery, it's interesting, I was, I was reading about it, of uh, nearly one-third of every lottery winner goes bankrupt within three to five years. One-third. Majority, bankrupt or not, of lottery winners say that they were much happier before they won the lottery, before they got all that money. Do we have a godly set mindset and a self centered world? Are we just pursuing the next best thing, the next newest thing? Are we pursuing money or even success in a way or as how our, our world shows it more than we are pursuing Jesus? And I want, I want you to hear it's not a bad thing to be successful in your job. It's not a bad thing to have money. And that's not what Paul was saying either. If he was content when he had the money or when he didn't. It's when we create that to be our first mindset. We create that to think that money is going to bring us contentment. That the next promotion, if I just had a little bit more, if I just had ten more thousand dollars, oh, I'd be, I'd just be great. Are we content in every situation? Or if I just had the, the next thing, the next coolest iPhone or the next whatever in our culture, our society, they create this um, kind of mindset of wanting the next thing. Most clothing brands, their, their whole, there's an awesome documentary on Netflix about this, but their whole purpose is that in each season, they change whatever their style is of the clothing a little bit more so that when you just spent $100 on a jacket the year before, well, the next one is going to be a little bit different, and then they're going to create a pressure to make it so you feel like you have to get this new jacket. The old jacket is just fine. But you got to get the new one, right? Your iPhones, it's like the same thing over and over again. They're like, oh, we made the picture a little better. It's like, oh, I can take more pictures that I probably won't look at ever again. Or like they're going to, what other body part do you need to be able to just open your phone, your face, your thumbprint, your, whatever it is, it's ridiculous. Of the next one over and over and over again, I just want to call and text people. I have the newer iPhone, yes, but, (laughs) but it's crazy. Or televisions, they're out of control. I don't need a mid-sized sedan on my wall to watch Josh Allen play football. It's, it's just ridiculous. Thank you. I, I told that joke. I tell Kaylee these jokes <laughs> beforehand. They go way better in here. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Kaylee's like, yeah, maybe cut that one out. <laughs> I tried it. It went okay. Uh, but, but it's crazy to think of how, how our, our minds are trained and how much we can get sucked into society of feeling like we need more and more and how we, we just need to find contentment. And when we search for God through prayer and petition every single day, when we know God's character, when we start to learn more about God, we're going to realize that these things, they just don't matter. They don't matter. We've been driving around a Pontiac vibe with no door handles, not a working radio, and, the, and the, the, the windows barely work. It doesn't matter. I could care less. We did upgrade to, for a, a bit of a safer car. We have a child. But it doesn't matter. And these things, the more you pour into your relationship with God, the more, the, uh, more of a godly mindset you're going to have. And a lot of times I feel like we, we kind of do it the opposite way to where we try to be content and we try really hard to make the decisions when realistically we just need to go to God because it's God who is going to strengthen us and change our mind. It's not through our, our good deeds that then make us closer with God. No, it's God who changes our mind, renews our mind daily, and heals us from things, and who is our Savior, and who helps us to feel content. Another thing that I feel like really distracts us from being content in life is instead of keeping our eyes on God, we move our eyes to comparing ourselves to other people. And social media can be sometimes a good tool. I just 
I hate. I don't do it anymore. I, I, have, I have Facebook still for Marketplace, and that's about it. Because for me, I would go on social media, and man, especially in college, and I would scroll, and I would see like, like oh, this person got to go on this great vacation. And I'd be like, ah, I want to go on this great vacation. Or I hated, this is my pet peeve, and this is just something that I... Uh, did not like, but I, I went to school in Chicago, and like coming from like my parents at a pond, and I did a lot in the woods, and I was like I, I, an outdoors kind of guy, and I, <laughs> I just did not like when like on social media, the city kids would then go to like this expensive hike to where like you hike a little bit, and then you have this amazing view, and they have the Patagonia, and the hiking backpacks, and the whatever water bottle, and I'm like, look at me, I'm a mountaineer. I'm like, no, you're not. You live in Chicago. I lived in the woods. It was me, right? <laughs> and how, but, but with everything, with, with our, our body image or with our financial areas or with our families or with whatever, social media can be such a, a, a horrible thing of comparisons. And that's why I deleted it. Off. I would just constantly compare myself to others when God said, man, I have an amazing life for you right here, right now. You need to stop looking at others and look at yourself. My handiwork, God says. Instead of the the highlight reel, which is social media, and so often not even close to reality. Or sometimes we, we look at others and we think like, man, I wish I had that job or I wish that I had whatever. And we have this pursuit as a culture to be the best at literally everything. Like every kid wants to be LeBron James or Josh Allen or whatever. They're just the, the absolute best, right? And I feel like there can be some pluses to those things, but it could also be a dangerous game. Because we're not all going to be the best, and that's okay. I am super average. I'm a 5 out of 10, and I'm cool with that. <laughs> that is okay. I'm cool with it. It's a beautiful thing because I don't need to be some whatever I would need to be. It's okay with the position I'm in and the spot I'm in and the job that I have, and I I love it. Because my pursuit and my mindset is on Jesus, on what Jesus has for me. Another piece of, of learning is the practicing piece. Of first knowing who God is and, 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 who, and who you are in Jesus and knowing what things we should be pursuing and knowing God's character, but also the doing. In verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Paul says, first, instead of being super anxious about things, just bring it to me. Just sit in my presence. Because you're going to find, you're not going to find that contentment anywhere else in life. Just sit in my presence and then focus your mind on things that are true things that are admirable. That's a hard thing to do, of going into work or day-to-day things, of focusing on those things instead of focusing on the next promotion or how to look better or what the other person is doing. No, focusing on things that are praiseworthy from Jesus. That is where we find the contentment. It's first to God to heal your brain, to change and to not, who cares how much money you make or what kind of a box you live in. It is the things that are everlasting because all of those things are going to go away. It is the eternal that we should be focusing on, the love of Jesus. Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. And the more that we put those things into practice, the more habits that we create in our lives, says, and God of peace will be with you. Whatever you have learned, received, or heard from me, or seen in me, put it into practice. 
The more that we start doing this, the more that we start seeing this fruit, the easier it's going to be. The next step of faith that you take, the better it's going to be. And the next position that you, the, the next time that you say, you know what, Lord, I just want to do what you have for me today, God's going to show up because he's, uh, he's, he never fails. And it's through him who gives us strength. Even in situations that may not look like a success, God is working in beautiful ways. I had a, I, I've only preached like five times up here, and I feel like I'm already retelling the same stories. I hope not, but I have a wonderful pastor, Pastor Judy. I've talked about her a few times. She was my pastor in college. She had this awesome testimony of when she was preaching at a retreat one time. It was a, it was a senior high retreat at a camp. And she connected really well with one of, uh, one of the, the boys who was at the retreat and stuff. She was the speaker and then went and would talk to people. And this, and this poor kid was coming from a really, really tough home life. He was coming out of trying not to be addicted to drugs. He was almost basically homeless at the time. And really needed, was in need of money. A senior high student. And so she thought to herself, all right, for a living, she goes and she speaks to different places, but she thought to herself, God was, God was kind of putting on her heart to give her money that she received from speaking at that retreat that weekend to give it to this kid. And she spoke truth into this kid and, and spoke the word of God into this kid of even, even being prompted to say, I think you're going to be a pastor one day. And this kid coming from a situation that he's in is like, no way. And so she ended up giving him that money, and he went further downhill, um, spent it on drugs, spent it on different things that he really shouldn't have. And five years later, she was at a, a, a conference, a pastor's conference, and saw the student there. And was talking to the pastor of that church that the kid was going to. And was asking, like, oh, oh, I didn't realize that he was here. And that pastor said, yeah, a couple years later, he hit rock bottom and he got clean. And the one thing that stuck with him is when you said, I think you're going to be a pastor one day. Finding contentment and knowing and putting into practice of, ah, this money doesn't matter. But what true, what's true, what's noble, what's praiseworthy does what God has for me, does. She was in a mindset of, of praying to God, praying for the student, and then God putting something on her heart, doing the action, and then seeing the fruit years later. What a beautiful story that is. Paul, writing this, I have learned to be content in every situation. He's writing this from jail. And this is not even jail like we would see it as these days, it's a harsh, brutal jail. He's saying rejoice always. I'm going to say it again, rejoice. Be content in every situation. I have found the secret even from jail, even from a space that really does not look like things are going well. He has found content in Jesus because he knows that Jesus loves him. He knows that Jesus is not going to fail him. And in the time, being able to spread the gospel and focusing on the things that matter to, to different people within jail or even um, the, the guards there and, and being able to help them come to Christ and know the gospel. And writing these letters from a situation that may be extremely hard. And for me, sometimes that is the space to where it's hardest to say, you know what, God, I, I need your strength and a whirlwind where you don't know what's going to happen next. I have a photo, maybe, up here. And the first one, there it is. Looks like a hurricane. Looks not great. Sometimes, and our life can look like just an absolute just whirlwind of things. And when we're so focused in on that and focused in on the troubles that we may be going through, focused in on not being happy in the space that we're in, focused in on not being happy with the scenario that life has presented us, we can get caught in a bit of a whirlwind. It's interesting, Jesus, and I hadn't really thought about this, but Jesus, as he's walking through his ministry with his 12 disciples, 12 of his best friends, he then just dies. Not just dies, but he dies. 
And from their perspective, that must have, those three days must have been crazy. I've been following this guy for so long and their life must have been turned upside down, first of grieving the loss of a friend, but also like wondering what is going on in our life. And do we find contentment when we are asking ourselves what is going on in life? When we feel that we're in a whirlwind. When really, I'm guessing, the disciples at the time did not see the full picture. And what that uh, was, was just a little snippet of that painting. In life, it's hard when we're focused in on such a little piece of something, on such a little whirlwind of life, on a harsh situation that we feel like we're in and that maybe God's abandoned us when he hasn't, finding that contentment. And the only way we find that contentment is through his strength. Not that God's going to just automatically take the situation away, but he's going to walk with you. And we do that first through prayer. Because sometimes we can't see the full picture. We can't see the full beautiful painting that God is creating in our life. Are we looking to God every single time through prayer and petition to find that secret of contentment? And are we putting those practices into play in our life of seeing the fruit of focusing our mind on things that are right and praiseworthy and admirable and acceptable to Jesus and letting him do amazing things through your life and just not caring about the things that the world tells us we need to care about. Are we finding that contentment in Jesus, the perfecter of faith? Because Jesus is so much more than enough. You feel burdened by your sin, he's your savior. You need healing in your life, he's your healer. You need joy, he brings you joy. Are we coming to Jesus through prayer and petition every single day and in every situation? It's a simple concept, but how often are we doing it? So please pray with me. We'll continue uh, um, to worship. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would humble our hearts and our minds, God, to just first searching you, Jesus. To just first searching what you have for us in every situation. God, I pray that you would pour down your grace and mercy on us. That you would help us to feel content in whatever situation we are in. And content as a church body, as content in our own lives, content in you, Jesus. God, I pray over that this morning. We thank you and we love you for everything you're doing in our life, that you have done in our life, and that you will do in our life, God. I pray that if we are in a waiting period of not being able to see the full picture that you're painting this morning, God, I pray that you would give us rest, knowing that your timing is the best timing, God. We love you, Lord. Amen. This morning as we go, church, Start with prayer and petition. Let the peace that transcends all understanding come over you. Go and be content in whatever situation life brings you because Jesus is enough. Because Jesus is so much more than enough in our life. Thank you.